Uh, so I sort of titled this talk, but why is the snow gone? Uh, with the hopes that people would get the, uh, the Captain Jack Sparrow reference. Uh, but it would have been a slightly more accurate title to say, but where is the snow gone? And um, for the rest of this, we're going to talk about some observations and the sprinkle of modeling uh, about snow redistribution on Arctic sea ice. Um, I'd also like to thank my uh, many, many co-authors who contributed in, in various ways to some of the work um, that you'll see here. Um, and a lot of this work involved uh, pretty extensive field work. Uh, so there's many uh, other contributors to that who I didn't have space to list here. Um, so I want to start with a, a little bit of a puzzle. Um, here, what I'm showing in the center plot is a map of um, net snow deposition in red um, and erosion in blue um, on a uh, patch of level second year ice. It's about 50 meters by 65 meters. Um, and this is showing the net change um, in the surface on this piece of ice from November 6th, uh, 2019 to uh, April 30th of 2020. So most of the winter season, um, this is a drifting ice flow in the central Arctic on the Mosaic expedition. And what do I mean by level ice? I mean, it's, it's really flat. This photo on the right here is, um, is actually the, the piece of ice in question. Uh, you might notice I was actually taking a photo of the sun dogs, not so much the ice, <laughs> um, but this is, this is the environment we're talking about. Um, and over this, this whole winter time period, uh, this region of level ice accumulated about two to three centimeters of snow. This, this particular region about three centimeters, um, others that we studied around two centimeters. Um, and that's not because it didn't snow here. So this plot on the right is showing um, the accumulation um, in the, the solid dark line. So for this level ice, um, or the precipitation from a vertically pointing uh, KA band radar um, in the dotted line. Um, and what we see is essentially that um, the uh, precipitation, or if we uh, assume a snow density of 330 kilograms per meter cubed, um, the precipitation exceeds the observed accumulation of the level ice by about a factor of 10. There's a, about a 20, uh, 23 centimeter uh, difference between how much snow we actually observed accumulating and how much we think should have accumulated based on the precipitation measurement. Um, and so the, the question I'm going to uh, pose some theories for in the rest of this talk is where did this snow go? Um, lest you think, David, what's 20 centimeters of snow among friends? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's not very much. Uh, that can be a big difference on, on Arctic sea ice. Um, and so just an example of one of the impacts of this, um, this plot is showing um, the observed ice growth um, over this time period in the black stars. And the blue line here is a 1D, uh, very simple um, uh, column model um, showing that with the observed snow accumulation, we can match this growth uh, really quite well. Um, the red line is showing the hypothetical case where if instead of the observed accumulation, we had just uh, applied the precipitation as indicated by the, the radar measurement, um, you see we actually grow substantially less ice. Um, it, this suggests that the, the snow redistribution or the, the lack of snow accumulation on um, this particular piece of level ice probably increased its ice growth over the season by about 45%. Um, so that's a big, a big difference. Um, more generally, the amount of snow we have on sea ice is, is really important. So um, snow is an excellent natural insulator. In the winter, the more snow we have, the less ice growth we can see. Um, snow is between uh, about 7 and 12 times more thermally insulating than the ice. Um, and in the summer, we have the opposite effect. Uh, snow is, has a very high albedo. Um, and so the more snow is on the ice, the more it'll protect um, the ice from shortwave radiation and the less ice melt that we'll have. Um, and just to convince you that 20 centimeters of snow is a big deal, here's a photo of Arctic sea ice showing that, you know, we really do have this little um, snow often on the ice. 
Um, and it's not just sort of cartoons showing this. Um, there have also been sensitivity studies um, using SICE, which is the um, sea ice component uh, used in, in a lot of CMIP-6 climate models, is the one we use up at NCAR um, in CESM. Um, and basically, this sensitivity study from uh, Urego Blanco and others in 2016 showed that of the, the uncertainties in the model, um, three of the top six have to do with the snow, whether that's the snow thermal conductivity or a couple of parameters related to the snow albedo. Um, now, this sensitivity study didn't include any uncertainties related to snow redistribution uh, because snow redistribution isn't present at all with this model. Um, and I'll, I'll argue for you that that's uh, uh, potentially an important uh, future step for us to take. Um, okay, so a quick roadmap of where we're going to go in this talk. Um, I've just hopefully convinced you that uh, you should care about the fact that we are missing some snow um, from, from the Arctic sea ice. Um, in the next uh, three sections, I'm going to talk about some hypotheses we had for where the snow might have gone. Um, these are snow loss into leads, snow redistribution on the young ice, um, and snow drifts around ridges. Uh, finally, I'll provide a summary and a brief outlook. Um, and I will uh, hopefully keep this all well under time. Uh, so there's lots of time for questions. Um, I look forward to discussing this. Um, and so the first hypothesis we had for this discrepancy is that maybe the snow is lost into leads. Um, this is right, leads are cracks in the ice, oh, nice dynamics. Um, basically causes divergence. Um, you get open water that then ice rapidly freezes in. Um, and in this open water, right, when the water is still open, if the snow gets blown by the wind into the water, it is lost for pur purposes of being snow on top of the ice. Um, obviously, the mass is not lost. It contributes directly to the ice mass balance. Um, and the reason that, that this was sort of hypo one of our first hypotheses um, arises from some, some other recent work. Um, so about, uh, it's over a decade ago now, um, uh, Kate Leonard and Ted Maxim did a study in the Bellinghausen Sea um, where they, they concluded that um, about half of the snow in that falls as precipitation in the Southern Ocean could be lost as blowing snow into leads. Um, there hadn't been direct study, or there hadn't been direct studies um, in situ of this process on Arctic sea ice. Um, but some reanalysis products like uh, Petty and others, uh, Nisosum product, um, try to account for blowing snow loss into leads. And they get that about a third of the, the precipitation in the Arctic is lost into leads. Um, for what it's worth, we also have a brand new advanced snow physics uh, module in SICE that includes um, some of this blowing snow. Uh, and although it's, none of this is published yet, some of the preliminary analyses also suggest that runs with this are losing about a third of the snow, blowing snow loss into leads. So the modeling of the Southern Ocean study suggests it's potentially a significant source. Um, but we wanted to study this um, in situ. We wanted to, to try to actually make direct measurements of this process. Uh, and to do this, we had a really incredible opportunity um, to make measurements on the Mosaic Field Campaign. So it was a nearly years long, nearly year long uh, drift experiment in the Central Arctic um, where we started. Here's my house. Um, we started uh, north of, of Russia uh, in October 2019 and we drifted um, until late July. Um, and on this, uh, on this experiment, we were fortunate for me, less fortunate for my colleagues, uh, that we had many, many leads forming in the immediate vicinity of the ship, and we were able to uh, study these leads to determine how much snow is lost into them. Um, these two maps are the same, they're just showing with and without the, uh, the rest of the site plan. Um, so of the leads that, that we observed forming, um, we picked four of them that we could basically keep track of when the lead had formed, so we knew what the atmospheric conditions were um, while the, the water was open. Um, and we could also access them and take ice cores. And we used the stable water isotopes to determine how much snow mass was actually incorporated into the lead ice. Um, I mentioned we, we picked these leads in part because we knew the meteorologic conditions at the same time um, as forming. And the reason we think this is important is, of course, we only have four leads that we're sampling. 
And so we want to be able to relate this to other processes uh, and hopefully use this to inform uh, our understanding in the models. And so here on the left, I'm showing um, a, a contour map uh, showing the distribution of 10 meter wind speed on the X and two meter air temperature on the Y um, for the entire winter period, November to April uh, at Mosaic. Uh, you can see that wind speeds are typically between about two and 10 meters per second. Air temperature is typically between around negative 35 and negative 15. Uh, and the reason I'm showing these two variables is you can think of wind speed as a proxy for how much snow might be blowing and uh, air temperature as a proxy for how quickly is the lead going to freeze. Because uh, once the ice is frozen, we can no longer lose snow into open water. Um, here are just uh, examples, uh, ice core photos of three of the, um, the leads that we studied. Um, this is what very typical first year ice would look like. Uh, top of the core is to the left, bottom is to the right. Um, and these three leads all formed under what we're considering to be fairly typical uh, wintertime conditions, at least for, for mosaic. So air times between negative 30 and negative 20, um, and wind speeds kind of spanning zero up to about negative, uh, up to 12. Um, the fourth lead that we cored, however, was very, very different. Um, this lead formed during uh, a, a sequence of record-breaking warm air intrusions in mid-April that brought uh, high winds and extremely warm temperatures um, to the mosaic site. Um, so you can see the, the contour plot here is, is well outside of the, um, the 10th percentile contour. Um, and the ice that we took from this lead also looked completely different. So the ice core down here in the bottom for the A lead, um, you can see it's opaque. It doesn't really look like ice. It looks like slush or potentially even like snow. Um, so right off the bat, we, su we suspected that this lead was going to be very different um, and that, that there was potentially a lot of snow in here. Um, I won't go into the details of our uh, chemistry and, and statistics, uh, but you're um, happy to discuss uh, more if people have questions. Um, this is the uh, the snow water equivalent um, within each of these leads, so per unit lead area. Um, and basically, you can see that uh, indeed the this A lead, the one that formed under the uh, incredible warm air intrusion, um, that had quite a lot of snow. It had about 35 centimeters of snow water equivalent. Um, we think that this was responsible for, or, or leads during this event probably consumed uh, almost all of the snow that precipitated in the, the week um, up to and including the event. Uh, and that actually accounts for about six to 10% of the snow budget uh, for the entire winter. So single extreme event, um, you know, a, a decently large impact. However, under typical wintertime conditions, we have really, really minimal snow loss into leads. Um, none of these exceeded uh, three uh, centimeters snow water equivalent. Um, these leads would have had really minimal impacts on, on the snow budget as a whole. Um, and so that's, so, you know, extreme event, yes, possibly um, uh, we can lose a lot of snow into leads, but for most of the year, uh, leads probably are not responsible for the discrepancy we observe. Um, I just want to highlight briefly what we think is going on here, uh, because some people are, are uh, often, it's, it's not totally intuitive. Um, we think a large part of the, the difference between this, uh, the A lead and the other leads um, is the air temperature at the time of formation. So the, dur during the A lead, during these warm air intrusions, we observed open water persisting uh, for almost two days. Um, which is very unusual for uh, for the winter here. Um, more typically, we would see leads freeze over with a, a skim of ice in a matter of hours. Um, this plot on the left here is just uh, showing that relationship um, using the, the turbulent heat flux uh, pro, um, uh, parameterization from uh, Andreas and Cash. Um, and so the x-axis here is air temperature, the y-axis is the time needed to freeze uh, three centimeters of ice uh, ice thickness and a hypothetical 20 meter wide lead with I think six meters per second air wind speed. Um, and basically you can see in the blue line that uh, for air temperatures around you know negative 15 and below, uh, the lead freezes over in a matter of a couple hours. 
This is the typical air temperatures we saw um, during most of the mosaic drift. However, as air temperatures warm up past negative 10 degrees Celsius, the time it takes to freeze a lead increases really quite dramatically. Um, we think that this result also actually corroborates well with the, the result from Leonard and Maxim, where the leads that they observed consuming this much snow uh, were, were present at air temperatures of around negative 10, a little bit warmer. Um, so we think this is, this is really a consistent story. Um, so snow loss into leads. Well, we think it, it probably accounted for some of the, the discrepancy, um, specifically the precipitation that happened. I'm sorry, I'm losing my mouse. Um, the precipitation that happened up here in the upper right during these, uh, these mid-April events. Uh, but we don't think it's, it's responsible for the majority of the, the snow loss. Um, while we were studying the leads, um, while we were studying the snow loss into the leads, we also noticed uh, another curious thing um, about snow redistribution on Arctic sea ice. Um, this was that the snow redistribution actually on top of the young ice. Um, and so the plot here, uh, the bottom plot's a little bit messy, but I'm showing the distribution of snow accumulation on uh, five different areas of, of young ice. So these are refrozen leads um, that we were able to observe on mosaic. Um, and I'm comparing it in the dotted black line with the uh, distribution of snow accumulation observed uh, on mature ice. So you can think of this like that same level ice that I was showing uh, in the, the laser scan at the beginning of the talk. Um, it's probably easiest just to look at the, the top panel here. This is just showing the, the mean values. Um, and basically what we observed is that the, uh, um, you know, at the same time that the uh, mature ice um, was accumulating very, very little snow. I mean, uh, within basically measurement error of zero, um, the young ice was accumulating uh, about between two and eight, two and a half and eight centimeters of snow on top of it. Um, and in case you're wondering, well, is, are these just drifts at the edge of edges of leads? Uh, no, this isn't. This is actually uh, measurements taken out from the center of leads, uh, where we no longer have the drifts on the sides. Um, this is a photo of, of Philip and I taking measurements on one of these leads. Um, and so uh, based on the, the sort of field work we were doing, we came up with uh, four mechanisms that were responsible for this preferential accumulation. Um, the first is that when, uh, when new ice freezes, uh, we get this brine skim on the surface that creates a very effective uh, sticky snow trap for windblown snow. Uh, the second is that frost flowers um, will create these small aerodynamic obstacles. Um, and you can see basically between, in between 2A and 2B, where we had a blowing snow event, um, we've effectively uh, filled in the snow on this, this very small lead up to the thickness of the frost flowers. Uh, and then three, we saw this preferential accumulation persist even above the height of the frost flowers. And our suspicion is that this is due to basically enhanced sintering by the fact that uh, the snow surface here um, is still warmer um, above the young ice or the refrozen lead than on the mature ice. Can I ask what sintering means? Sintering, yeah, of course, sorry. So sintering is the process of um, snow grains fusing together um, into a, uh, and becoming stronger. Um, and so if you've ever had the experience of like right after a fresh snowstorm, you go out and you sink in. Uh, but, but a few days later, especially if the wind's blown over that snow, you can walk up on top of the snow without punching through. Um, that's sintering. Sintering's the difference between those. Um, and it's, it's really, really effective uh, in the Arctic in particular uh, because we have enormous temperature gradients um, within the snowpack. Um, but yes, thank you. Thank you for the, the question. And yeah, if anyone else has a third phrase for us, please don't, don't hesitate to ask. Um, and so the, the key thing about all these processes, we looked at them and we said, well, these are processes that should be present. They should act on more or less any young ice in the Arctic, right? It shouldn't just be limited um, to these leads. Um, and so once we, once we thought that, we actually went back and tried to uh, uh, piece through the literature to find were there previous references um, to uh, this preferential accumulation on young ice. Um, and we didn't, we didn't find all that much, 
uh, but at least going back, you know, back to the, the 60s, um, sort of tucked away in different papers, there's references to, to this preferential accumulation. Um, so we think this is consistent with what we, uh, what we observed as far as the mechanism. Um, Quincy involved. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, um, so we think this process really is actually quite universal, even though it's not not represented um, in any models that we know of. Um, we wanted to uh, uh, get an estimate of how important might this be for models, um, and so we did a a sort of um, an offline analysis um, of of what, what might happen if we'd included this process um, in CESM. Um, this is just uh, showing a representation of how the ice thickness distribution is modeled within SICE. Uh, and the main thing to keep in mind is that uh, snow is only added, currently in SICE, snow is only added per precipitation event. Um, and so the youngest ice has few precipitation events, hence it tends to have very, very thin snow covers. Um, for, our ad, for our offline analysis, we basically just redistributed the snow um, from the thicker categories to the thin ca thinnest category, um, according to, to what we'd observed in the field. And this is just an, an example of it in action um, for, a, for a single uh, time point. So on the left here, I'm showing the thinnest, um, the snow thickness on the thinnest, the youngest ice category. Um, within a CESM2 run uh, in the Arctic in, in March. Um, and you can see that uh, by default across most of the central Arctic, um, in the default configuration of SICE, there's very, very little snow on this thin, thin ice, uh, less, you know, a centimeter or less in, for the most part. Um, this is just showing that our redistribution scheme works. After applying the redistribution scheme, um, we uh, uh, increase the snow thickness on the thinnest ice category. Um, and in the right here, uh, we're showing um, the same thing, but just for, for the single uh, grid cell that's indicated by this star, um, where our redistribution scheme increases the thickness uh, of snow on the thinnest category with very minimal effects on the other categories. Um, I will say this is an offline analysis, so there's some, some caveats there. Um, but but in in this analysis, we found that um, by neglecting the uh, uh, redistribution of snow onto the youngest ice in the Arctic, um, the current model is probably overestimating heat flux and hence ice growth um, by uh, about six percent on average. Um, again, this is an, an offline analysis, so um, that shouldn't be taken. Uh, too, uh, too literally in terms of the number. Um, but to put this in, in context, we also compared um, the uncertainties associated with neglecting this snow redistribution process uh, with uncertainties in snow thermal conductivity and snow density, uh, which are processes that have, have uh, received a lot more scrutiny in, uh, um, in the climate model uh, or in the, the CS model development. Um, uh, and essentially what we find is that the magnitude of the impacts of neglecting uh, the snow redistribution process um, causes a fairly similar uncertainty um, in, in the potential uh, overestimation of heat flux as the, the uncertainties in density or in thermal conductivity. However, oh. <laughs> Uh, sorry, for those of you online, you seem to have lost the screen in here. Right. Um, yeah. Maybe just close it to see that. I have to enter the password. Hmm. Any thoughts, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? He says the airplane has cooled. Airplay. Yeah. Can you see the screen at all? Yeah, I can see. Well, barely. It's fuzzy. We don't have an airplay passcode because we don't use airplay. Somebody here does.
seconds. Hopefully they're coming back. How's that? Do you hear us now, Ms. Dia? Yeah, we can hear you now. Can you see the screen? We can't see the screen yet. I just made you co-host though. But the, yeah, I guess the owl is coming through NSIDC, right? And the screen is coming through David's computer. Yeah. Oh yeah, so we can see the screen share. We just can't see the owl. So I think you need to go to the video. Oh, there. there you go. Now it's coming. Okay. Great. And we can hear you great. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry for the, the technical difficulties, everyone. Um, okay. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this a little quickly. But um, the, the key point here um, that I want to make is that the uncertainties in things like thermal conductivity and snow density, um, we don't know if the model is currently representing uh, excessively dense snow or not dense enough snow. Um, we do, however, know that the uh, um, this process of snow redistribution onto young ice, um, at least in, in this offline analysis, uh, can only lead to the model overestimating ice growth. So it, it represents a uh, potential bias um, in our model as opposed to a, an uncertainty. Um, um, this is all, all work that we published last year. Um, we have some uh, ongoing work um, where we're trying to actually do this in the coupled climate model context. Um, and I won't have time to go into in too much detail here, uh, but the, the sort of sneak preview of that work is that um, Although we, in the coupled model, we do see uh, um, this decrease in congelation growth, um, as we'd expect from, from uh, including the snow redistribution process. Um, in the wintertime, that actually ends up getting balanced out by increased frazzle growth and increased snow ice formation. Um, and we're still trying to identify, is this, is this really accurate or is there potentially some, some offsetting error going on here? Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that in the coupled context, uh, including this process actually leads to increased surface melt in the summer uh, because we, we have a, a slight um, snow loss um, on average from the ice. Um, so more to come on that, hopefully in, in the next year or so. Um, Okay, so we investigated um, snow redistribution onto young ice. It's um, certainly potentially important for the ice mass budget. Um, I don't show here, we also made some attempts to estimate how important it would be for the snow mass budget overall. Um, and the, the short answer is uh, not very much, not enough, certainly not enough to explain anything uh, like this discrepancy. Um, and so now I want to go back to the same type of uh, laser scanner topography data that I was showing at the beginning. Um, but instead of looking just at level ice, uh, I also want to look at sea ice pressure ridges. Um, so pressure ridges are formed when ice dynamics basically uh, pushes the ice together like tectonic plates and build small, uh, very small mountain ranges. Um, <laughs> they are. <laughs> Uh, a meter to uh, a really big one that might be uh, uh, stick five meters high uh, above the ice surface. Um, the keels are actually much greater underneath the, the water. Um, but for purposes of, of this talk, um, they serve as aerodynamic obstacles um, that build snow drifts around them, just like we see snow drifts um, around aerodynamic obstacles uh, down here in the mid latitudes. Um, I'm going to focus on one particular ridge uh, named Fort. Fort Ridge. Um, this is shown up here in the topographic map on the upper left. Um, red is high, blue is low. Um, these data were collected on January 4th. Um, and you can just see a, a photo over here on the right of us um, making measurements from the top of this ridge. Uh, so you have a, a visual on it. Um, and what I'm going to walk through uh, quickly here 
is just looking at how did snow accumulate around this ridge over a period of just over two months. Um, so this is going, we're going to go from uh, early January uh, to early March. Um, I'll show that in the map on the bottom left here. Um, so red is snow accumulation, or is snow deposition on net, blue will be erosion. Um, and then also on the right here, um, this is a different way of looking at this. This is how much accumulation are we seeing as a function of distance from the ridge crest. Um, and so as we step forward um, through every, every two weeks or so, um, we can quickly see that snow is primarily accumulating in drifts um, very uh, non-uniformly um, near the ridge itself. Um, that's, whoops, that's the final one. So um, perhaps as expected for, for snow drift around an aerodynamic obstacle, we see that there is considerably more snow accumulation happening near the ridge um, than out on the level ice, uh, say out to the right side of these maps. Um, uh, this wasn't just the case for Fort Ridge itself. We also studied other ridges, um, specifically with our, our laser scanner. Um, and in general, what we see um, is this pattern of uh, snow accumulation concentrated either right near the, the ridge crest itself or maybe offset just a little bit, uh, a couple meters off the crest. Um, and one other thing, if you, so these plots here, which are showing distance to the ridge crest and snow accumulation, um, the colors are showing what time the measurement was made. Um, if you look, especially at the, this FY ridge down here, you can kind of tell that as time goes on, we're getting less and less accumulation, um, uh, snow accumulation in the drifts around the ridges. Um, so potentially we're, we're approaching a kind of saturation. Um, this ridge in the middle here, which is a, a second year uh, ridge, uh, we think probably was fully saturated with snow by the, by the end. Um, okay, so this brings us back to our question. Can snow accumulation around these ridges, uh, preferential deposition here, can that account for the difference between the level ice and um, the precipitation that we've been going back to? Um, and the short answer here is actually no. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was a surprise to us. So I'll draw your attention uh, just to the top panel here. This is figure D. Um, here we're showing a comparison of the accumulation and precipitation for three ridges. Um, these are the, the left three columns and three areas of level ice, um, all that mosaic. Um, the, the accumulation that we observed with the laser scanner is shown um, in the stacked bars and the, the black star is the net accumulation. Um, for comparison, I'm also showing the, the radar-derived precipitation um, converted into, uh, into accumulation with a density of 330 um, in the red stars here. Um, and so what you can see is that, you know, for, the, for these two ridges, um, the uh, snow accumulation roughly balanced precipitation. And uh, so maybe if the entire area were ridges, you could say that were balanced, but only about a third of the area um, is covered by these, these first year ridges. Um, whereas out, out on the level ice and actually on the second year ridge as well, the uh, precipitation greatly exceeded uh, the accumulation measurement. Um, for those of you who are curious, why are all the precipitation measurements uh, different? Um, that's because this is the precipitation only for the time period that we were able to actually measure the ridges. Um, and so there were logistical and ice dynamical constraints in terms of when and where we could actually measure um, measure things. So um, we sort of uh, aggregate everything. The snow accumulation around existing ridges, it can explain about about a third of the discrepancy, about seven, seven or so centimeters, um, right? And so we're still left with this really big discrepancy. Um, and I've added the word existing to ridges here um, as, as sort of a, a leading the question, because I don't think this is the full story with ridges. Um, there's two, two additional pieces of, of evidence I'd like to bring in. 
First, this is that same um, accumulation versus precipitation graph I've been showing over and over again. Uh, but now I've added information where this is when we had active ice dynamics happening around the field site. This is just recorded by, by people uh, being there and, and observing it. Um, and so these red bars are showing periods where um, you know, the ice was actively cracking apart, coming together, and we were building new ridges within, um, within the mosaic field site. Um, you can see that this happened a lot <laughs> throughout the mosaic campaign. Uh, it was a very dynamic ice environment. Um, we built a, a lot of new ridges during this period. Um, the other thing that will, will kind of draw your attention is that we had basically this uh, quiescent period from early December, roughly till the end of January, where we didn't have a super um, uh, active ridge formation. Um, and for this period, if you, if you look at the different, the uh, change in accumulation versus the change in precipitation, you see those actually, um, those actually aren't so, so different for this period, um, especially when you factor in um, the redistribution to the existing ridges during this period. Um, we actually can balance the, the snow budget for this quiescent period when we weren't building new ridges um, or, or opening new leads, I should say. So the, the sort of temporal correlation with the ice dynamics, I think, provides a hint that ridges, new ridges specifically, or leads might play a role in this discrepancy. Um, I've already shown you evidence that we don't think the leads were responsible. Um, so that leaves, leaves essentially one primary culprit here. Um, the other piece of evidence I want to point out is that um, even as of the oops, sorry, um, even as of the first time we measured this ridge, there were already snow drifts around it. It turned out it was really, really logistically challenging to get out and measure a ridge uh, before the first snow snow drifts formed around it. Um, and this made it actually quite challenging to establish a snow budget for for new ridges. Um, we did, we did manage to do this once. So this was a very small ridge um, uh, named Ridge to Snowware uh, that formed um, over in uh, kind of on the, off towards the edge of the snow tree sampling area. And it's not a, not a very tall ridge, it's about a meter high, four meters wide. Uh, but in this case, we were able to actually make measurements of it um, with our laser scanner before the first snow accumulation event. Uh, or the first snow redistribution event around this ridge. Um, and what we see saw was that basically for this for this ridge in this time period, the snow accumulation around it exceeded precipitation by a factor of, of almost three, about a factor of two and a half. Um, remember that for the existing ridges, that ratio was roughly equal, precipitation roughly matched accumulation. Um, and so we are our hypothesis here is that it's actually new ridges are one of the primary sources of, um, of the snow sink, um, at least for the Mosaic campaign, and potentially other places in the Arctic. Um, we think this raises some really interesting questions in terms of considering future field campaigns. How do you go about actually measuring it? As I mentioned, it was, it was logistically challenging for us to, um, to, you know, to get laser scans before the ridges accumulated snow. Um, and also there's a historic bias to uh, focusing on sort of existing flows rather than the complicated areas between them um, in, in situ sea ice research. Um, but we think this is a, a potentially important place for future research as well. Um, so yeah, so again, we're, we're sort of filling in the gap here with new ridges. Um, what I didn't show here is that there is we considered a, a number of other processes, things like errors in density estimates, uh, sublimation, um, and, and effectively couldn't find anything else to explain this discrepancy. Um, and so while it's not the most satisfying result, right, it would be great to have a fully closed snow budget for Mosaic. Um, we think this is the, that new ridges are kind of the most plausible explanation for, uh, for where, where snow is getting redistributed. Um, in summary, um, I'm trying to remind you kind of the key points we found here. The first was that, um, to our surprise, very little snow was lost into leads under typical wintertime conditions. 
Um, and it may really require these exceedingly warm conditions where the lead, the open water stays unfrozen for an extended period of time to lose a lot of snow into leads. Um, we also highlighted that uh, young ice preferentially accumulates around two and a half to eight centimeters of windblown snow um, and showed that this, this may have impacts uh, for the overall ice mass budget that are worth considering in large scale sea ice models. Um, and finally, um, highlighted that uh, snow drifts around ridges and in particular, um, the new ridges is likely a primary sink for the snow redistribution. Um, this snow redistribution greatly limits the snow that can accumulate on the level ice. Um, and so is, is also important for the overall uh, mass budget and evolution of the ice cover. Um, in most of what I presented here is either, either published or, um, or in the process of, of being published. Um, I will say, in terms of what we are doing now, um, I'm, I recently started this postdoc here at NCAR to look at actually implementing some of these processes into SICE, see what, um, how we could use them to inform our climate models. Um, and also looking at uh, trying to improve our understanding of how does the snow redistribution that we observe in the winter link with the, uh, uh, what happens uh, when the sun comes out uh, in the summer. Um, and I've, I've put question marks in the bottom stuff because it's stuff I'm not currently funded to do, but I'm very interested in. Um, one is thinking about what role could remote sensing play in some of, uh, of these questions um, related to uh, snow redistribution and ice evolution. Um, and then also I wanna highlight, um, I think this is a, an important gap in our understanding relates to processes that are happening right around freeze up. So what is happening during the initial snow accumulation phase where we're getting snow established on the level ice? Uh, because if, if snow accumulation worked the same way the whole year round, we would see extensive, expansive areas of bare ice. Uh, and we simply don't, don't see that for most of the Arctic. Um, and so I think this is a, an important sort of longer term goal to think about uh, in the future as a, as a community. Um, I will quickly mention, since this is NSIDC, that um, all of the, the data we presented here is all public. Uh, most of the codes are processed in the terrestrial laser scanner. Um, data is available. I'd be happy to chat with anyone uh, if they're interested in using this or collaborating. Um, and um, most of what I showed here uh, is already published. Uh, for the stuff that isn't, I'm more than happy to share a preprint. Uh, if anyone's interested. Um, so with that, uh, thank you very much. Sorry for the technical issues, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, David.